Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jan Roos, and I am here with another solo episode. So I got some pretty good feedback from our episode that we just did on marketing automation, and I was thinking about something that I think might have resonated with this. And this is another narrative I want to maybe challenge a little bit that I've been seeing a lot in the legal community, marketing, coaching programs, et cetera. And that is the idea of running a lifestyle practice. Now, I have done a lot of research into this stuff over the years. I was as big of a Tim Ferriss fan as most people are. And I've gone a lot of uh, ways into the direction of figuring out what lifestyle businesses can and can't do. I know a lot of people who run lifestyle businesses. I know a lot of clients that run lifestyle businesses. I know a lot more that have tried to do that and ended up losing a lot of time and slash or a lot of opportunity costs in the pursuit of something that might not have been realistic in the first place. So I want to start with what I, and then just, you know, to kind of uh, spoil the ending here, I do think it is possible to run a lifestyle business. I think it's achievable, but the circumstances might be a little bit different than what most people imagine. And I will certainly say what most people are being sold these days. So I want to start off with a quote from Jeff Bezos, not a person I'm a fan of personally, but um, somebody who I think has been uh, pretty successful in this whole uh, (laughs) market-based economy. And this is a quote from him that said, your margin is my opportunity. And this was in the context of business models that Amazon, the marketplace could go after. And, you know, it kind of represents a function of how the market works in general, right? So in this case, you can think about the margin that you have in your business as a law firm, right? If you are just quietly making money hand over fist, you've got a lot of money uh, margin, and that is something that's going to be attractive to competitors. The way that markets work is when people find opportunities, they go and pursue them. The larger the opportunity, the more stiff the competition generally, right? That's why you see venture capitalists pouring billions of dollars into software startups where the margin is you know, theoretically infinite once you build the code base. But, you know, this is essentially what you need to maintain a lifestyle business. And I wanted to expand the definition of margin a lot, too. So um, we've also been doing a lot of coaching around operations within the Case Fuel program. And I think the concept of monetary margin is something that gets discussed a lot. But I think for smaller businesses, time margin is a very important thing, right? If you're able to run a business in three hours a day and most of your competition is working eight, you've got five hours of margin built into that, right? But very importantly, for the purposes of setting up a lifestyle business, time and money margin are exchangeable, right? If you have money, you can buy time and vice versa, I would say. If you can have time and you know how to invest that properly, you can get more more business. And you know, especially at the smaller levels of being a solo, when you are the prime mover for your business, it's very important to understand how to do these things, right? So by definition, we need to have a lot of margin in order to have a lifestyle business, which leads us into our next challenge. What are we going to do when people come after our margin, which we've developed for this lifestyle business? And I want to think of this in terms of competitive dynamics too. And again, um, you don't need to be a direct competitor of Jeff Bezos to have be subject to this pressure. It's just basically you got to think about all the people that are coming out, right? Every single new attorney that gets minted, every single person who's a local competitor who's big that starts muscling in on turf. The more margin that you have, the easier that you have, the more attractive you're going to be as a target, right? Um, People rob banks because the money, (laughs) that's where the money's at. And the more juicy your lifestyle business, the easier things are, you know, the, the, the more of a target you're going to have on your back, right? So I want to kind of get into why this wasn't that much of a problem. And kind of depends on on what people were forced to, right? So I always like to say the story, and uh, I ended up actually looking this up as a result of preparing for this podcast, but the story of the dodo. So for people who don't know, and I actually thought this was in Hawaii, but it actually turns out it was on the island of Mauritius. Uh, But the dodo was a large flightless bird, and it had no predators. So it was able to live for millennia and millennia unmolested, more or less. And then when people ended up landing and they had cats and dogs and other different things in the mix, the dodo went extinct 
pretty quickly. And a lot of people who have been living with easy firms, and again, there's this, this has meant different things at different times of history, are a lot like the Dodo. Their existence and continued success is more or less at the mercy of nothing bigger or better being around to completely wipe them off the face of the earth. So if we're talking about stuff a little bit earlier, if we're talking about maybe, you know, 20th century, this could be the situation where somebody was the um, the famed small town lawyer, right? Uh, it was really, really hard. There weren't as many degrees going around. You could set up shop and you could be the guy, right? You could have the referral base. That's that's all you really needed to do. Again, we saw what happened to those guys towards the end of the 20th century. Um, there's also situations with people who entered at different eras of this, uh, you know, this new 21st century in the digital era, right? If you were the first guy to get on Google and you had the SEO stuff, great. You're that guy. If you're the first person to hop onto Google ads, if you're the first person to hop onto Facebook ads, maybe you've been living fat and happy, but the minute that you get a well-funded competitor, somebody has the resources to come after your pie, you might end up going extinct. It's something to worry about, right? So at the end of the day, when the proverbial wolves are at the door, it's not going to be a just your existence is not going to be guaranteed. You have to really come think about what is going to be your competitive advantage. And this is something that we've gone over on previous podcasts. A lot of the work that's done by people like Michael Porter, the big thinkers in business, the kind of books that you'd be reading if you're in an MBA program all has to do with assuming competition in these big dynamics, right? So first, I want to say that if you have a lifestyle business, it doesn't mean that you're absolutely screwed, but it doesn't mean that you're safe either. And I think as the market becomes more developed, as people become more sophisticated, as the access to the tools that can get you further in business becomes more democratized, it makes it harder for incumbents at the end of the day, right? So what's it going to be, right? If your advantage is that you're the first person to set up shop, then unfortunately you are the dodo. The next time somebody wants to go open up a store in your town, that's pretty much all it really takes to knock you off the top of the heap. But you know, there's obviously people who run lifestyle businesses and there's people who have competitive advantages that are sustainable. So the next question I really want to ask is what kind of competitive advantages are compatible with running a lifestyle business? And a couple of the things that I want to sort of explore, one of the things that I see, and this is something that is really, really hard to replicate. One of those that's super classic is going to be reputation, right? So if you have the firm that's been around forever, if you have, you know, the million Google reviews, you have, you know, you're, you're the best, even within a niche, right? Um, that's an advantage that's going to be really, really hard to replicate. Another advantage, and this is something that we see often with some of our clients, is some of the people who have the best product. And again, this is taking sort of a broader view than how most people categorize it as attorneys. But if you go from being, okay, cool, I'm a great estate planning attorney to I have this great package and we do our documents in this way and we have a nice name wrapped around it. And we'll also do these ancillary services that are going to get you a much better outcome than if you go to Joe Blow down the street or God forbid, legal Zoom. Then when Joe Blow opens up his shop down the street, it's not really competition, right? You have a little bit more of a monopoly pressure on this. And the last thing that I would kind of consider is the access to a different type of customer, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. If you are plugged in with a specific group of people, a specific type of business, if you know you have a local, national, or, or ethnic group that you're really tied into, it's going to be really, really hard to overcome. Different marketing methods are a decent way too. If you've been really, really hitting the bricks and like, you know, let's say you have a fantastic YouTube video strategy and you've been building this content for years, you've had a lot of people on the podcast who have really just dove deep and gotten really, really good at a certain thing. That's not the kind of thing that you can overwhelm just by showing up, right? And that kind of makes the paradox really tie back to a lot of the other things we've talked about, about showing up and doing the work, right? The harder one your success is, be it in marketing, be it in product, be it in running the business as a whole, the more of a moat that you've built around yourself too. And this is the thing that I kind of want to close this out on. A lot of the times people think their competitive advantage is going to be something that they're buying in a package for two or $5,000, right? If your competitive advantage is something that, you know, the only thing separating you from somebody down the street is whether you can run your credit card or not, that's probably not a competitive advantage, right? So at the end of the day, a lot of the people that are proposing a lifestyle solution, ultimately you have to really think about the game theory of that, right? The more successful the people that are proposing lifestyle solutions are in the market, the more competitors you're going to have with the business model that you're really trying to hang your hat on, right? So at the end of the day, it's kind of a self 
uh, liquidating problem, right? The more success that is, the and I've seen this in a lot of info products, which is why we don't sell info products, right? Like, um, you know, there's a <laughs> not to go into too much detail, but like I know uh, people who run uh, agency startup programs, right? And the thing that stinks is that the stuff that they're using to help people out of the gate becomes harder and harder to use with every client that they use, right? And there's only so many niches around there, and it's really tough to compete in those. So the people that are signing up, you know, now versus two years ago are having a much harder time. Update. But again, it's something to just kind of consider, right? At the end of the day, it's tough to buy a competitive advantage. It's hard to build one in-house, but at the end of the day, that's really going to be a lot more sustainable. And if you think about the people, just to kind of connect this to the possibility, there are people out there that are running seven-figure practices on five hours a week, but they had to build a lot of stuff to get there. So I will leave you guys with that. Uh, as far as next time, we've got some stuff in place. We have a group that's going to help you develop one competitive advantage, which would be the ability to close more clients. And that will allow you to uh, reinvest in your marketing efforts, among other things, perhaps your operations, perhaps hiring staff, that kind of stuff. That is available at our new Facebook group with a closing class that I believe is for estate planning attorneys. Uh, anyways, we'll have links to that in the show notes. And for everybody else, I will see you guys next week, Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern on the Law Firm Growth Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.